In the first video, we heard about the general features of atherosclerosis. Let's now take a closer look at the processes that cause this disease. As we said, atherosclerosis involves a lifelong continuum of changes in the arterial wall. These changes include lipid retention and their chemical modification, which provokes chronic inflammation in the arteries. Atherosclerosis starts with endothelial dysfunction. This dysfunction is often also called endothelial activation and can be caused by high blood pressure. Imagine you have a pipe that is constantly under pressure. Over time, the inside of the pipe will get damaged. Since endothelial cells are the innermost layer of blood vessels, this is exactly the place where this could happen. Also, high blood sugar levels lead to changes in the cells that also render them activated. The endothelial cells that are supposed to be a natural defense shield stop working the way they should. In fact, they start expressing addition molecules that capture LDL particles. The next step in this process takes place when the captured LDL particles leave the bloodstream and reach the tunica intima where they accumulate. Therefore, an increased concentration of LDL cholesterol above the physiological need is a major risk factor for the development of atherosclerosis. Once the LDL particles accumulate in the intima, they become chemically modified by specific enzymes. The most common chemical modification is oxidation. However, other types of chemical modifications can also take place such as acetylation, methylation and glycoxidation among others. Aha! Uh -huh. Glycoxidation! I can identify the word glyco, which means sugar. But what does oxidation stand for here? Yes, Asu. High glucose levels, in connection with the metabolic syndrome, can stimulate the attachment of modified sugar molecules to LDL, which turns it into a pro-inflammatory molecule. We will hear more about that later. This accumulation of chemically modified LDL particles provokes an immune reaction within the intima, which increases endothelial dysfunction. As a consequence of this inflammatory reaction, the endothelium gets leaky and monocytes from the blood are able to penetrate into the intima. There, they differentiate into macrophages and engulf the chemically modified LDL particles, becoming foam cells. Hmm, foam cell? That sounds funny. Like cells in a bathtub. Yeah, unfortunately, this isn't that funny when it happens. Foam cells are basically macrophages filled with lipids, mainly LDL cholesterol. This gives them literally a foamy appearance. Macrophages could digest normal cholesterol, but they have a problem with these modified versions. Thus, they cannot leave the site of inflammation and become part of the fat accumulation themselves. Their accumulation within the intima layer leads to the deformation of fatty streaks on the arterial wall. This stage can sometimes be found in children as young as 10 years of age. As you have heard, the fatty streak phase alone does not cause any evident symptoms, but it is often the start of a progression into a more dangerous phase of atherosclerosis. The immune cells stuck in the plaque release inflammatory signals, so-called cytokines. This recruits other immune cells, which leads to more and more accumulation of those cells and to a chronic low-grade inflammation. Do you remember that term from our other units? This stage is then also characterized by a fibrous plaque formation. The fibrous cap consists of connective tissue like collagen, which is also thicker and less cellular than the normal intima. It contains a huge number of foam cells, smooth muscle cells, and lymphocytes. The fibrous cap initially serves as a rupture protection of the plaque. But once the disease progresses, more and more immune cells in the plaque start dying in a process called necrosis. This enhances the inflammation and also makes the plaque increasingly unstable. So far, we talked a lot about atherosclerosis and LDL cholesterol. However, we should talk about the triglycerides in the context of atherosclerosis as well. 
The reason of this is that patients who have hypertriglyceridemia may be at a significant risk for cardiovascular diseases, even if the LDL cholesterol levels are within healthy ranges. Recent genetic and epidemiological studies have demonstrated that triglyceride and triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, such as VLDL, are the main causal risk factors of residual atherosclerosis. Residual atherosclerosis is defined as the remaining risk of cardiovascular events despite treatments that lower risk factors such as LDL cholesterol, blood pressure or high glucose levels. Triglycerides, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins and their metabolites can promote atherosclerosis via increasing inflammation, oxidative stress, endothelial cell dysfunction and formation of foam cells. Fat, fat, fat. Always just fat. That's getting so boring. Asu, don't be like that. Remember when we mentioned the modified sugars before? These are quite important in the process of atherosclerosis. But let's hand it over to our colleague Gerhard, who is an expert in this field. 